Hello, everybody. We're continuing our series on the Holy Spirit. Um, we're doing a three-part uh, sub-series on the Spirit in Scripture and Tradition. So in the last episode, we looked at the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, today, we'll look at the Spirit in the New Testament. And then next time, we'll look at the Spirit in the early church. So in tracing the Holy Spirit through the Bible and the early church, uh, we said this last week, but it's worth saying again, we must keep in mind the idea of the progress of revelation. That is to say, the person and work of the Holy Spirit is revealed progressively and not all at once. Um, and so uh, the full personhood and divinity of the Holy Spirit is not explicitly defined until the fourth century. Uh, but as we'll see today, uh, there are some very important movements in that direction uh, in the New Testament. Um, and so indeed, while the spirit is not in as clear a focus as it will be in the early church, um, we can still identify some key areas of the spirit's work in the New Testament that will lead the church to affirm the full divinity and personhood of the Holy Spirit. We'll focus today on three areas, um, the spirit's relationship with Christ, as both bearer and bestower of the spirit, uh, the church and contemplation. So first in the New Testament, we see that Christ is the bearer of the spirit. Um, to put this another way, the spirit is present at all of the important events uh, of Jesus' life and ministry. So for instance, at Jesus' incarnation, uh, Luke 1:35. The angel tells Mary that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Um, and then at Jesus' baptism, uh, for instance, in Luke 3, uh, we get the famous image where when Jesus is baptized, the heavens are opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove as the voice of the Father comes from heaven. You are my beloved son, with you I'm well pleased. Likewise, in his temptations, uh, Luke 4, we read that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. When Jesus returns from his temptations and is in Nazareth, uh, he gives that first uh, famous sermon in Luke 4, where he unrolls the scroll of the prophet Isaiah to chapter 61. It reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Um, next, we see that at Jesus' transfiguration, the spirit is likely present there as well. Now, this one's interesting because as opposed to all the others on the list, the gospel writers don't explicitly note the presence of the spirit. And yet it has been the uh, long tradition of the church that the spirit was present at the transfiguration in much the same way that the spirit was present at Jesus baptism. In both cases, you have the uh, audible words of the father to the son, and then some other kind of sign indicating uh, the spirit's presence. So at the baptism, that's the dove. Uh, in the case of the transfiguration, uh, the spirit is descending not in the form of a dove, but in the form of a cloud of light. So hearkening back to the glory that filled the, old te the temple of the Old Testament. Uh, we also find in the letter of the Hebrews uh, 914 that the spirit was actually also involved at Christ's crucifixion. Uh, reads back in verse 13, if the, if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So somehow Christ's crucifixion um, is that offering being made to the father is taking place through the spirit. Um, Christ's resurrection, we find evidence of the spirit being involved with the resurrection of Christ. So for instance, Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Uh, 1 Timothy 
Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, presumably his resurrection, seen by angels, etc. Uh, and finally, first, uh, first Peter 3, 18, <clears throat> for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. And then finally, Christ's ascension. Uh, back to 1 Timothy 3.16, um, if we look at that again, um, this little poem says, he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Um, and so some scholars have read uh, the spirit to be the active player in, in the other verbs in this passage. So to summarize the words of one theologian, the church has never sufficiently confessed the influence of the Holy Spirit exerted on the work of Christ. Christ performed his mediatorial work controlled and impelled by the Holy Spirit. Now, Christ is not only the bearer of the Spirit, he is also the bestower of the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit is bestowed by Christ. Um, this was, in fact, prophesied by John the Baptist. Luke 3, 16, John said, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Um, of course, this was predicted by Jesus himself as well, especially in that farewell discourse of John 14 through 16. So for instance, in John 14, 26, we learn that the coming paraclete, uh, the Holy Spirit, a comforter, will bear witness to Jesus in 16, 8 to 11, that the spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And in 16, 13 to 14, the spirit will guide Jesus' followers into all truth. Of course, this was accomplished then at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, fulfilling the prophecy we looked at last time in Joel chapter 2, and marking this as the beginning of the end times. Uh, the birth of the eschatological community. So the end times have been going on for 2000 years. Um, and yet we are, um, because the spirit has been poured out, uh, living in the eschatological age. Um, and then throughout Acts, we see that the spirit empowers the mission to the Gentiles, um, as we read in the various stories of the book of Acts. Um, so yeah, so Christ is not only uh, the one who um, is filled with the Spirit himself, but he's the one who then bestows the Spirit. All right, turning from Christ to the church, the New Testament teaches us that the Spirit animates the church, which is the body of Christ. So if the Spirit um, was in Christ, we shouldn't be surprised that as we are in Christ, uh, we too receive the Spirit. So first, the Spirit unites believers to Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For in one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. Um, so John Calvin said, the Holy Spirit is the bond by which Christ effectually unites us to himself. Next, we see that the Spirit empowers God's people. In Ephesians 5, uh, Paul writes, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, note here that uh, the verb be filled is second person plural. Um, sometimes people want to take this as like individually you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, but in this particular context, the emphasis is actually on the need for us corporately um, as a church community to collectively be filled with the spirit. The whole congregation is actually in view. Third, we see that the spirit brings unity in Christ. Ephesians four, Paul exhorts us to be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace for there is one body and one spirit. So another theologian says the church is a fellowship of the spirit is the way we could think of what it means to be the church, 
Finally, the Spirit gifts the body of Christ. Uh, we see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when Paul writes, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Um, and on and on Paul goes in that chapter. There's a lot we can say about spiritual gifts, uh, so much in fact that we will save that particular topic for a later episode in this series. Continuing with uh, the spirit and the church though, uh, the New Testament tells us that the spirit breathes new life into God's people. Second Corinthians 3.17, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Likewise, Romans 8, 2, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So the spirit brings freedom. Um, and this freedom is meant to be directed towards a certain end. It's a freedom for a life that is characterized by the fruit of the spirit, Galatians 5. Um, this life is also characterized by holiness and confidence as heirs of God. So Romans 8, picking up in verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Now, what's interesting is that not only does the Spirit give us life now, but the Spirit is, in fact, the down payment on the life of the world to come. Uh, so 2 Corinthians 1.22, uh, God has put his seal on us and given us his Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Likewise, Ephesians 1, verse 13 in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Um, so the Spirit is uh, kind of like the uh, ring you would give at engagement, an arabon, um, that is a promise of the fullness of something to come. Um, and what is it that's to come? Uh, well, it's the glory that is to be revealed to us, Paul tells us in Romans uh, chapter 8. Um, and what's really interesting here is that this glory that is to come, uh, this new life that's to come, is even going to encompass the renewal of creation itself. Romans 8.23 um, or 8.22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the, of the spirit groan inwardly as we await for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And the good news is that as we await this future glory, the spirit helps us in our weakness, uh, Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. So again, the Spirit gives us life in the present. It's a down payment on the life of the world to come. And in the meantime, uh, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Finally, the Spirit enables us to contemplate God. So Paul writes that the spirit mediates the knowledge of God to us. First Corinthians chapter two, uh, picking up in verse nine, a very famous passage. Paul writes, but as it is written, what no eye has seen nor ear heard nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the spirit. For the spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. And in fact, Paul says later in 1 Corinthians, it's only by the spirit that we confess that Jesus is Lord. Um, so this is important for the development of the spirit as a distinct divine person. Because what kind of being would be able to uh, fully know and be able to mediate the knowledge of God to us 
well, it must be a being who is truly divine. So this passage is very important for later Christian reflection on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also discover that the Spirit reveals God's word to us. Uh, so in 1 Peter 1, we read that the Spirit inspired the prophets of the Old Testament, um, pointing ahead to Christ. Um, likewise, in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 21, we read that for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Uh, but not only does the Spirit reveal God's word to us, uh, the Spirit also allows us to receive God's word. Um, so Paul writing in 1 Corinthians ch chapter 2, uh, verse 12 says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So the spirit uh, reveals God's word. The spirit enables us to receive or understand God's word. And then also the spirit applies God's word to our present day. We see this a few times in Hebrews, for instance, at 3, 7, um, the author of Hebrews says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, and quotes the Old Testament here. Um, and so as Cole writes, when it comes to Christ, who is now at the Father's right hand, the theological key to bridging the gap between past and present, heaven and earth lies in pneumatology. So again, putting all this together, we're connecting uh, Pentecost and Ascension. Because with the Ascension, Christ is reigning as king over the right hand of the Father. Uh, but this is connected then to the sending of the Spirit, um, which is how God is active in our world and in our lives um, right now. So looking ahead to our Zoom discussion, uh, it might be worth uh, reflecting more fully on it's a question of how is the New Testament description of the Spirit both similar to and different from uh, the description of the Old Testament uh, Spirit? So tying these two videos together. Um, the next week, we'll take a look at the development of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit according to the early church.